Welcome to Theology Matters. In this six-part series, we take you to the Southeast Symposium on Ecologically Informed Theological Education. The symposium included plenary, panel discussion, and breakout sessions on the emerging field of religion and ecology in seminaries and theological schools. We begin with the plenary presentation from Dr. Marshall Shepard, of the University of Georgia. The event was held at Columbia (laughs) Theological (laughs) Seminary. Yes, Gipple's office is right down the hall, so I hope while you're here for this conference, and also to those in the Columbia community beyond these couple of days, uh, come on down to my office and let's uh, continue the conversation about creation care. And I think tonight's presentation will definitely provide a lot of food for thought, uh, because that is what Dr. Shepard is best at in my um, three years of knowing him. Given that this is an academic conference, I can assure you that Dr. Shepard comes well credentialed for the task tonight. He holds three degrees from Florida State University. He is a professor at University of Georgia and director of the Atmospheric Science Program there. Uh, He is the past president of the American Meteorological Society. He was previously a scientist at NASA. He has done incredible research in the field of meteorology and climate change. And again, since it is an academic conference, I know that academics like to hear about the research. And I feel like these are uh, good $5 words that can get us going tonight. But in his research, he seeks to understand aspects of Earth's hydrometeorological and hydroclimate systems, such as rain, (laughs) precipitation. But he'll also be quick to tell you he is not a forecaster, he's not the weatherman, and that's how most of us interact with Dr. Shepard's former students and colleagues in this work, but he'll be quick to tell you he is not a forecaster and he doesn't research this for the purpose of telling us, is it going to rain on our wedding day or on graduation? That's not his job. But what he is interested in is how other systems interact with climate change and are impacted by climate change and these weather systems. And that is where, as a simple pastor and lover of God's earth, I encounter his work because he is committed to bringing his research into people who sit in the pews, people who stand in line at the grocery. He engages with folks from all walks of life and he encourages his students and his artistry as a teacher to do the same, that it is a conversation, the conversation about climate change needs to be happening beyond the labs and the halls of scientific inquiry. And that is why he is the perfect lecturer for us tonight and conversation partner because he he does some of his best work during the Q&A session, I find. Uh, So as we think tonight uh, with his guidance, what are the social, environmental, theological implications of climate change? and we can be in conversation with the science of climate change and weather systems. So Dr. Shepard, thank you for being here. Thank you. Can you hear me? Is it, is it, can you hear me okay? Thank you, and you know, you know I, I, can't, uh, I couldn't turn down this opportunity because uh, I often say that uh, if scientists aren't out there speaking about this topic, uh, there are certainly people that are willing to speak about it and, and replace that with misinformation. So if we aren't out there, who is? And thank you for that introduction. It was very kind. Uh, I, I make it a habit of hanging out with people with their own billboards. So I don't know if you know, but Reverend Mer- 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 Mergen. Kate's actually on a billboard, or it was, I don't know if it's still up, but it's just showing her great work here in the state, so it's an honor to be introduced by her. Um, I want to start out, the first of all, the title might be provocative, and I actually said a little prayer before I came in here, because uh, I'm using the word zombies, and I actually gave, uh, we talked about it, I was like, is that going to be okay to use that? Because I promise you there's an analogy in there, and it really uh, uh, hopefully works for you, but um, this is a topic, and I promise throughout this talk, zombies, cola, and sports, it'll all kind of get in there by the end of this 40 minutes or so, so uh, we'll, we'll make that as a task. I want to start out with this picture here. This is the road leading from Savannah to Tybee Island, and it's flooded. It's underwater, and it's underwater not because there was a hurricane, but that's just a king tide. 
regular King Tide day. And uh, people in that area said they really haven't seen this too often, but it's happening more frequently. Sea level rise is a consequence of climate change. <clears throat> so what I'd like to talk about tonight is the notion of our perceptions about climate change, even extreme weather events in the context of climate change versus reality. That's a topic that really has been on my mind lately. Uh, I will say, let me just kind of get all of the, um, you heard some of my background. So I am a professor at the University of Georgia and before that at NASA. Um, most of my research involves looking at rain, <laughs> uh, hurricanes, uh, uh, those are the aspects of the hydroclimate, severe storms, et cetera, trying to place them in different contexts as it relates to both urbanization, climate change, and other factors as well. Um, most of my research grants are funded by NASA, the U.S. Forest Service, Department of Energy, and so forth. Uh, I have an endowed professorship from the University of Georgia as well, so I should go back here quickly and you'll see this distinguished Georgia Athletic Association professorship. Uh, often people see that and say, wait a minute, I thought you studied weather and climate. What do you know about athletics? Uh, well, like the IBM professor of computing or the Coca-Cola professor of business at the University of Georgia, the Athletic Association is actually a separate entity. It kicks over about $12 million to the university for a couple of endowed professorships. And I happen to have one of those endowed professorships. And so it's a really neat gig <laughs> so, uh, to have, you know, because it actually also helps fund some of my students and my research agenda and program as well. So back to perception and reality here as we kind of launch into things and launch is a pun because I did work at NASA. Uh, looking at this little picture here, it's not necessarily clear what we're looking at. Uh, but in reality, what we're looking at is a picture of our former president, George Bush. Now, there's actually no message in the fact that I chose President George Bush. It just worked that, that with this particular picture. But the, the point is the paradigm is needed to move us beyond this notion of perception and reality in science. And before I even launch into the climate change discussion, take a look at this graphic from the American Association for the Advancement of Science, or AAAS, the leading science society in the world. And what I draw your eyes attention to is all the blue, because all the blue is the difference between what scientists think about a scientific topic versus what the public thinks. And on climate change, 87% of scientists believe that humans are contributing to changing climate, but only 50% of the public does. How did we get there that 37% uh, see something else? So I want to turn the volume down. This is actually, I, was at, I chair NASA's Earth Science Advisory Committee. So I was just in Washington, D.C. last week. And while I was there, I saw this really cool new visual, and hopefully it will keep playing for us. Uh, we'll keep get it one more time here, because it's really cool. And this is the 2017 hurricane season from the vantage point of NASA's satellites and modeling capacity. And so what you'll see, just we can just geek out on this for a second because I, uh, I, that's a little term because I host a show on the Weather Channel every Sunday called Weather Geeks. And so we have this term and segment called geek out segment. But look at the different hurricanes that you see. Here comes Hurricane Harvey uh, moving across the ocean. Uh, it's going to make landfall in Texas and then sit there for five days and dump about 48 inches of rain over Texas. Houston, Texas got in five days 48 to 50 inches of rainfall their total for the year on average is 34 inches. They got that in five days. Here comes Hurricane Irma, which we know impacted Florida. Look at all the dust that comes off of, Flor uh, off of Africa there. If you uh, cast your eye on parts of Spain, the Iberian Peninsula, and even parts of Northwestern Canada, you'll see wildfire smoke every now and then. So this dynamic Earth system, God's creation as we talk about, is amazing and it's fascinating. And so we know that there is this scriptural context for stewardship of this planet. Now, I understand that as a scientist of faith, by the way, I should put that right out there right before. I'm, 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 a, I'm a Christian. I, I grew up in a Baptist church here in Canton, Georgia, uh, just north of Atlanta. And so I have no conflicts between my scientific knowledge and my faith. But aside of all of that, this is just cool. <laughs> so you see Ophelia, and here's the climate link here. Which way does Ophelia go? It made landfall near Ireland. That's not normal. But one of the things that the scientific literature 
researchers suggest in a recent peer-reviewed paper is that because the Atlantic Ocean is warming and warming towards the uh, European continent, we're going to see more of those types of storms affecting Europe. Hurricanes, they're supposed to go the other way. So these are the weather weirding type things that, and by the way, if you're interested in getting that little uh, animation, it is available on NASA's Scientific Visualization Studio or SVS website uh, at, there at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. So my goals today are to highlight several challenges with the science and communicating weather and climate change, uh, challenge our own perspectives and biases that I don't think this audience has, but uh, typically other audiences that I speak to, such as Congress or even certain White Houses and others, uh, there are these perceptions and biases and then offer solutions. So first of all, we have to start right here and I'm going to say something about cognitive bias, a bit, uh, cognitive dissonance a little later, but I happen to work as a scientist in the fields of meteorology and climate. And because people experience the weather and climate, I often encounter this notion that people know just as much about it as from a per scientific perspective as I do, or at least they think they do. I can be in the mall or at Jiffy Lube getting an oil change and I mention casually that I'm a climate scientist and immediately someone's going to offer me their thoughts or viewpoints on it. I've got a friend that's a nuclear engineer. He never gets that. <laughs> he never gets any advice on fuel rods for nuclear reactors. Just doesn't happen. But a scientist that studies the weather, that's just, it comes with the territory. Um, People will come up to me with a straight face and say, what do you think of the Farmer's Almanac forecast this year? And I'll say, I think it's going to be inaccurate because it doesn't use uh, models the way we do for forecasting. But yet in the same breath, they'll say, well, I think climate change is a hoax. So think about that for a second. There, there will be, I think most people get that the groundhog is all fun and folklore and tradition, but there are a few people that legitimately ask me whether it's real. I said, it's eroded. It really is. It's eroded. <laughs> and so, the challenges we face as scientists in this field bring forth several sort of things that I've seen over the time in speaking to, uh, again, not only in scientific ivory tower audiences, but also in more public spaces such as Congress or uh, in my congregation or church. So over the years of doing this, from my career at NASA to my career as a professor and scientist at the University of Georgia, there are certain challenges that I've come across in this whole weather climate discussion. So the first one is overcoming perceptions in psychology. So let's go back to Houston for one moment. I just, I just told you that that storm, Harvey, dumped about 50 inches of rainfall. Now, there are, I'm going to talk about this from a weather and a climate change perspective. The first one is the weather perspective. We had people that were telling us, well, we had no idea it was going to be that bad. We just didn't think it was going to be that bad, yet I'm a contributor to Forbes magazine. I write about five columns a month for Forbes, and I wrote a week before the thing made landfall and said it's going to dump 50 inches of rain. But the, generally, people's perceptions of an extreme or an, an anomaly event outside of their experiences doesn't prepare them. So people in Houston get floods and rain all the time. And so they feel they had experience with a big rain event, but this was an anomaly event. And my colleague, Susan Jasko, is a good friend of mine at uh, California University of Pennsylvania, said that, you know, there's studies that suggest that people uh, struggle with the notion of an experience outside of their normal context. And I think that's true in life, not just with weather and climate. I mean, we think we're used to something. Yeah, we, we'll go out here and get on the road. And, you, know, you know, we're used to driving. We don't have an experience with a tragic crash because it's an anomaly event. So we can't perceive what that's going to be like. All right. And so that's what we saw with this flooding event. So that's the weather angle on this. The climate angle on this, there's a new area of climate change science called attribution. I served on the National Academy of Sciences expert panel last year that wrote the report on climate change attribution. Now what is that? Climate change attribution is this notion that current extreme weather events have some connective tissue to climate change. Now, that is a struggle for some because I'll, I'll want, as soon as I say that, or on Twitter, I'm at Dr. Shepherd 2013 for those of you that happen to be on Twitter. I'm actually quite active on Twitter. Um, but when I say something like that, they'll say, well, Dr. Shepherd, we've always had hurricanes or we've always had snowstorms. And I said, that's true. I mean, home run hitters always hit 
home runs in Major League Baseball, but they were hitting longer ones and more of them after steroid use. Right? So there's nothing that suggests that we cannot modify the natural cycle. Right? So there was a flood event, I don't know if how many of you remember it, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana a couple of years ago, a couple of summers ago, dr dramatic flooding. There was a study that was done, an attribution study after that, that suggested that that was 40% more likely to, to have occurred because of climate change. Anybody know the logic behind this? We, we in science talk about something called an accelerated water cycle. Now we learned about water cycle in fourth grade. My, my son, who's in fifth grade now, can rattle it right off. Precipitation, condensation, run off. You, the kids are cute, they run it right off. But can anyone understand this notion of why a storm like this might produce more rainfall under a climate change context? Or I'm about to throw a real curveball at you. It really just totally baffles people when I say this. I can make an argument that the blizzard or the nor'easter that we're seeing right now in the northeast with all the snow, I can make an argument that snowstorms are uh, more amplified because of climate change. What? Global warming means more snow? There are peer-reviewed studies that suggest that, by the way. What's the logic behind that? Anybody want to take a crack at it? What's this whole notion of an accelerated water cycle about? Go ahead. No, 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 that's a good thought, but not related to the ice caps. Yes, obviously someone that is familiar with the Clausius Clapeyron relationship. Uh, a very basic <laughs> physical understanding, because that's what he just stated. He just stated the Clausius Clapeyron relationship. So let, here's a pop quiz, and I promise it won't be hard as reciting the Clausius Clapeyron relationship. At what time of the year are we most uncomfortable in terms of temperature and how it feels to us? Sometimes winter for me, I, I don't like cold weather, so I would have said winter too. But what I really was aiming at is the summertime. In the summer, if you're in Atlanta for a long time, or Florida where I uh, went to college, the humidity along with the heat is oppressive. So in the summertime, it's warmer, the atmosphere has more water vapor available to it. So as our climate warms, it has more water vapor available to it. The evaporation rates from lakes and rivers and oceans is providing more water vapor to the atmosphere. That water vapor events eventually condenses to form rainfall, eventually condenses to form snowstorms. That's what we mean by an accelerated water cycle. So these things are happening. This is not something 10 years out or 40 years out. There's a reason we're seeing uh, more urban flooding. There's a reason we're seeing snowstorms with more heavy snowfall. Okay. All right, we can come closer to Atlanta for this whole perception and uh, reality thing. Two or so years ago, maybe three, we had two inches of snowfall in Atlanta, and it just shut the city down. Uh, how many of you from, are from the Atlanta area? So some of you remember snowpocalypse. So this is a perception issue on the weather side because we were in a winter storm watch. As the forecast got worse, the weather service issued a winter weather advisory. Now, much of the public, including some of our um, policymakers, thought that that was a downgrade. But in fact, it was an upgrade. And so uh, certain things weren't done in terms of preparing for that storm. So perception and reality is always a challenge. Here's another perception issue. I'm gonna kind of deal with the weather stuff before I move to the climate stuff. About 80% of you don't know what that means. What does 40% chance of rain mean when you hear the meteorologist say that? Who said 40% of the area? Okay, let me get another answer. Is she right or wrong? Hmm. Okay. Is she right or wrong? Any other thoughts? I know there's some more out there. What does that mean? But based on what? Flip of coin? <laughs> She's like, you tell me, you're the meteorologist, exactly. Yes, one more. But how does that translate to 40% or some percentage? I don't know. One more. So 40% of the time when the conditions are as they are in the present. So the analog method. Yeah, no, I, I hear that. I hear that one a lot too. It's not, not right, but um, I, I, there was a, I hear it. Yeah. 40% chance of rain means if I carry my umbrella, it won't <laughs> That's what I. That's what I hear. Actually, the person that said 40% of the area was closest, but not exactly correct. Let me tell you a little story. I was up, I have a 10 year old son, Anderson, and we were up in Helen tubing down the Chattahoochee River. And it's summer, it started raining. 
And there's a woman right next to me in her tube, and she didn't realize I was a meteorology professor at University of Georgia. And she said, see, those meteorologists, they're always wrong. They get paid to be wrong all the time. There was a 20% chance of rain, and it's raining. So I'm thinking to myself, well, it wasn't 0%. <laughs> but the reality is what percent chance of rain means is that if you take an area around Atlanta the National Weather Service is responsible for, it's a formula. Percent chance of rain is equal to C times A, where C is the confidence the forecaster has and A is the area. So if the forecaster is 100% confident that 40% of the area around Atlanta is going to get rain, it's a 40% chance of rain. If she is only 50% confident that 40% of the area is going to get rain, what's the percent chance of rain that day? 20%, aha. So that, if we're out and about and it starts raining and there's only a 20% chance of rain, that, must, that doesn't mean the forecast was wrong, right? That means you were in that 20% of the area that day. So help me erode this notion that meteorologists are wrong just because people don't understand what percent chance of rain means. So hopefully you all know. Now, zombie theories. There's one of the words, <laughs> zombie, I just call these weather and climate zombie theories, you know, these theories that have long been refuted by scientists, but they kind of live on in public folklore, or they just kind of live on. And so, you know, for example, one is that it doesn't get cold in deserts, right? People think that it doesn't get cold in deserts. Two, people think heat lightning is a thing, <laughs> right? How I many of you, you all have heard of the heat lightning. It doesn't exist. It's no such thing as heat lightning. I mean, people say, oh, it's lightning caused by the heat of the day and the sky is lightning up. It's just lightning too far away to hear the thunder. So there are all of these, that's a true statement. That's a true statement. It's just cloud to cloud or cloud to ground lightning that was too far away. Uh, people think that it gets cold and that means the polar vortex is coming. That doesn't happen. People think that, you know, clouds coming out of airplanes or chemtrails. I mean, Google that, you'll see a large body of literature on that topic. It's just basic physics. As uh, warm, moist exhaust comes out at that altitude, it's colder, it condenses, forms a cloud, just like when we breathe on a cold morning. Right. So those are what I call zombie theories. And there are these perception and psychology issues as it relates to climate as well. So let's take a look here. Here is, again, I, because I'm a former NASA scientist, I use a lot of NASA data. Here is sort of perennial and long-term sea ice over the Arctic from the late, early 80s up to the present. So the white is the long-term sea ice that should be there all of the time. The gray is sort of the annual ice that kind of comes and goes. If you look around Greenland, you can see how it ebb and flow. That's real data, by the way, from satellites. This is not some cartoon animation that I had made. This is actual satellite data. And so one of the things that I want you to notice over time is what happens to the white because what we're going to see is that by the time we get to 2014 or so, something very interesting happens. I'll just let you watch. So we're at 20, 2005 right now, 2006. See the little running clock up there? You see what's, ha have you noticed what's happened over the last 30 to 40 years to the ice cover? Where's the white? That's, that's real data, I want to emphasize this. There's no warm season ice cover. Now let's talk about the science of that. Because that Arctic sea ice plays a role. We, we, want, we want to talk about the stewardship of our planet and care of our planet. It's not just about polar bears and the fact that they don't have any ice flows to live on. It's about the fact that that sea ice plays a role in our climate system. When that ice is there, it reflects some of the sun's energy back to space and regulates our climate. When it's not there, that extra energy can be absorbed by the ocean and the earth and warm the earth even more. That in climate science is called a positive feedback, or we often call it the ice albedo feedback. So that's one implication. The other implication affects our weather, where you live or where I live. Well, how so? Let's say, let's say we are holding a rope, and you pull on the rope and I pull on the rope. What is going to happen is if she pulls on the rope hard and I pull on the rope hard, the rope is going to be straight. Is that correct? Everybody following the analogy? All right. What if I loosen my grip somewhat on the rope? What's going to happen to it? 
It's going to sag some. It's not going to be as taut. Well, that same thing is happening to our jet stream patterns. Our jet stream patterns depend on the Arctic being cold and having ice and the tropics being warm. And when you have a cold, ice-covered tropic and a, a, a polar region and a warm tropics, the jet stream is stronger because there's a gradient. There's a larger difference between temperatures in those two locations. That's why we have jet stream. That's why we have wind, basically. Now, when we warm the polar regions and get rid of that ice, guess what that means? That's, you don't have as strong of a difference in temperature between the tropics and the poles anymore. You don't have as strong of a gradient. So our jet streams aren't stronger, so they start being wavier, have wavier patterns like that rope. And that means larger droughts or more amplified droughts. And that means colder snowstorm events because our jet stream patterns are just a series of waves like this. And the more amplified they are, the more severe the weather. See the connection. Now, these are things I would not expect the public to understand or know, but things happening way up there impact our weather here. Cola, here it is. We got cola. So it's not just about polar bears, climate change. It's about our kitchen table issues in line. That's, that's a message that I try to deliver in any public space. Because look at what Jeff Seabright, who's the former um, VP for environment at Coca-Cola here in Atlanta said, he says, increased drought, more unpredictable variability, 100 year floods every two years. When we look at our essential ingredients, we see these as threats. That's a Fortune 500 company that needs water for soda. And it needs oranges for Minute Maid orange juice. I mean, it needs sugar beets to sweeten their products. And they see the exposure to these. So there is a kitchen table issue that cannot be denied. And that's a narrative that we must continually share um, with our friends, our families, our congregations, our students. Kitchen table issues. Just this year, 2007, I don't know if you noticed this, but after Hurricane Harvey, gas prices spiked. Why did that happen? Because most of the oil and gas refining capacity for our country is in Houston. And so basic economics, we reduce supply, you increase price.